All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everyone, for being here. My name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the Associate Director for Marine Research here at Hatfield, part of Oregon State University. Um, this is a hybrid event, so we have folks online and folks in the room. And for both of you, the lights look weird. <laughs> and I'm going to apologize for that. Um, we had an event last yesterday, and our lights started flashing, and now they're not working at all. So this is the best setup that we can get. But for folks online, the presenter is going to look a little dark. Uh, for all of you, the room is going to look a little bright and the presenter is going to look a little dark. We're going to try to make this work. I hope you can see what we can see and we'll, we'll work with that. Technology is fun. <laughs> um, all right. So let me back up a little bit. For folks online, um, we have disabled your cameras and your screen share, but please communicate with us uh, using the chat box. Our volunteer, Roseanne, is here to help support you and make sure that you get your questions answered if you need those help. Um, and and at the end of today's presentation, you can put your questions for today's speaker into the chat box. For folks in the room, thank you so much for being here. Um, again, because this is a hybrid event, if you have any kind of questions, just raise your hand. I'll bring you a mic, and that way the folks online can hear our questions as well. Um, wanted to also remind any students in the room to make sure you sign up on the student sign-in sheet out on the um, entryway there. That is how we keep track of who's here for credit. So just make sure you get your name on there um, so we can make sure that you uh, get credit for that. I uh, want to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, next week's seminar on October 24th. Um, Rogerio Tadden is a professor with the Federal University in Rio de Janeiro, and he is going to be here to talk about how climate change impacts coastal tropic dolphins. So um, come back and uh, listen to and join uh, Rodrigo here next week, same place, same time. And uh, the other thing I wanted to do was make a little plug for our next Science on Tap, which is October 30th, when Julia Parrish from UW comes down and talks about how hot water has been impacting our local bird communities. So I hope you can join us for that evening event. So that will be at 6 p.m. on October 30th. I also make a little plug. We had a speaker change their schedule a little bit. So I now have an opening on December 5th if anybody would like to give one of these seminars. So if you know somebody or you are interested in giving a seminar, I'm looking for a seminar speaker on December 5th. Um, if you are interested in any of these events and you want more information, you can go to HMSC's website, go to the event page, and you will be able to find all the information to be able to join us in the room or online if you would like. Um, but for today, I'm excited for our speaker. Um, Jack Barth is a professor with the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. Jack's research focuses on uh, coastal ocean dynamics and um, coastal marine ecosystems, hypoxia, and intercontinental shelf dynamics. Jack has a bachelor's from the University of Colorado and a PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Woodhull um, Oceanographic Institute in a joint program in oceanography. After a position in the Department of Physical Oceanography at Woodhull, Jack has been here at OSU and he has been deeply involved in the HMSC community and um, conducting research to understand our changing oceans. And so I'm really excited to get an update on his work tracking hypoxia in our local waters. So Jack, I'm going to bring you down to the floor and hand the mic off to you. All right. Thank you, Cinnamon. You guys hear me all right? So Cinnamon said I have to stay in this box. I really want to walk over here and talk with you guys. In my, I told Cinnamon in my classes, I walk down the aisle and talk to the students. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what we've been doing to track uh, what's been increasing and more widespread near bottom hypoxia. So this photograph is kind of on purpose. Can anybody see the lighthouse through all that fog? So I'm going to use an image later of um, to think about a fog or a smoke from, say, a wildfire filling up a valley on the floor. That's kind of what you can kind of visualize hypoxia on the seafloor sort of looks like that. So I, we don't do all this stuff alone. There's lots of collaborators. 
Uh, Francis Chan and I have been working on this for a couple of decades now. Steve Pierce and Anatoly Arafif that you see down there are long-term research associates. Both of them retired on the same day last October. So 53 years of experience walked out the door on me. So we have a couple of new folks on there, Sean Coleman and Jace Marquardt. And then there's a, a slew of names in the middle. Some of you are in the audience who helped with some of the data that went into this talk. And this is, uh, I'm gonna eventually get to telling you the results of that paper that's referenced on the bottom there. So this is an outline. And I like that quote, it kind of explains why we do what we do. So I'll tell it just, I've given talks like this before, but I'm never quite sure um, where everybody is. So we're gonna do some background and then we'll get into the changes in space and time. So first one, why do we care? Well, you wanna sustain healthy marine ecosystems. And there's a lot of different uses of those ecosystems, right? You can see them here in the various photographs. Um, there's a sustainable development goal 14 from the United Nations that we're all working towards. And so it's really a, an understanding of how these ecosystems work, how they're changing and how we um, can best work with them to keep them uh, sustainable. So in, in other contexts under the Marine Studies Initiative, you've heard me talk about um, you know, the, the going and seeing a beautiful sunset and the artistic part of what we get from the ocean. But we certainly get food and we have um, recreation and of course, uh, possible renewable energy sources. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about this part of the California current, the Northern California current. It's a classic upwelling system. So we're at the uh, Eastern end of the North Pacific current that splits. Some of it goes South into the California current, some into the Gulf of Alaska. And the winds above uh, follow the North Pacific high and in the summertime blow from the north to the south. And in that little diagram on the bottom, and here's where I can practice my pointer. Let's see if this will work. The diagram on the bottom just gives a very simple uh, way that this works. The wind blows, pushes the surface water right towards you guys, but because the Earth's rotating, it swings off to the right pushes the surface layer out and it gets filled in from below and sets up that coastal upwelling jet, that yellow guy. And of course has the cold water all, all along the coast. And I'm gonna be talking about the upwelling season, which is shown just in cartoon form between these winds that are in the summer to the south and the, the reverse, at least at this latitude in the uh, winter. Well, of course, those upwelled waters have nutrients in them. They hit the light zone with the plankton and there are plankton blooms all along the coast. That fuels the food web, eventually ends up in these species that are commercially valuable. And so we want to, um, basically that, that's the impact that we want to see whether the, where the oxygen is high and where it's low. All right. So that's just a little introduction. We're going to talk about hypoxia now. How, how low is low? So this is uh, to get everybody on the same page about units. Okay, so normally hypoxia is found in enclosed or semi-enclosed bodies of water, certainly in lakes, um, in saltwater bays. These are This is a photograph of Long Island Sound and some of the areas on the East Coast. And we use this, oceanographers use this unit called milliliters per liter. So I'm gonna define hypoxia based on some studies of animal responses when they really start being harmed as 1.4 milliliters per liter. And you'll see lots of other uh, units out there. Um, for example, uh, milligrams per gram uh, that's more typical 
biology or actually the, the um, terrestrial water studies. The chem chemists like to use micromoles per kilogram. That's, that's what I'm told is the, the true unit of dissolved oxygen. So the paper that I just referred to, Dick Feely made me change everything to micromoles per kilogram or he wouldn't sign up. But I, I believe it, it's good. But for time immemorial, us oceanographers have used milliliters per liter. You'll see both. And then the, uh, the physiologists like to use that percent saturation right on a, on a seabird CTD with the dissolved oxygen, you can pick the little button that says saturation, for example. And Lisa Levin uh, lent Francis and I this slide. She does a lot of work on this uh, out of scripts. So marine animals need oxygen. These are just some examples of how, the, how as we approach hypoxia, each of the animals uh, starts to respond. So a hypoxia again at that 1.4 milliliters per liter. And I just did a, tried to do a calculation and it's like the oxygen at the top of Mount Everest, the, the percent. So think about that for a second. I mean, most people climb Everest with supplemental oxygen, right? But there's a few crazy people that have done it without it. So of course the organisms can probably stand it for a little while as well but then those that can move do move. Here's another way to look at that same idea. On the y-axis is oxygen in milliliters per liter, there's the hypoxia level. And as you go lower and lower, you affect um, uh, organisms closer to the base of the food webs. So right up at the top, the fish start to get stressed and can die off at near that 1.4. Mobile invertebrates, you got to go a little bit lower. So somebody tell me a mobile invertebrate. What, huh? Sea cucumber. If somebody said Dungeness crab, thank you. <laughs> this is good because when I go to different audiences, like I, I had this plot up at a, a talk at my wife's mother's place in Pennsylvania. They got what they had no idea what a mobile invertebrate is or a sessile invertebrate. I really should have put on there, you know, crabs, worms, whatever. But you guys know what they are. Okay, so you got to go a little bit lower. The sessile inverts, they're the ones that can't get away. The infauna are actually, in, you know, either on or in the seafloor, et cetera. Um, just as a preview, Francis Chan and I have been more focused on this. 0.5 level than 1.4. Just because that uh, actually, um, one of the studies that Waldo and Amy Keller and others uh, uh, did look at the response in a trawl of the organisms to the oxygen levels. And in, in that paper that Amy led, 0.5 seemed to be one of the big boundaries. So you'll hear us talk about severe hypoxia at 0.5 milliliters per liter. All right, I already mentioned this, this that a lot of hypoxic zones are in semi-enclosed waters. You recognize some of those on the East Coast. Also at the mouth of these major rivers like the Mississippi that are dumping excess nutrients into the ocean. So there's a very infamous hypoxia area at the Mississippi River plume. And uh, Nancy Rabelais and her colleagues have been mapping that for many, many years, talking about how big it is, how deep it is, what are the effects on the organisms. And then what I think is really neat is they've tracked it back upstream to the nutrient loads to try to correlate that to the size of the area and actually influencing policy around what the discharges ought to be. So that's kind of cool. Uh, I'm telling this a little bit of a story because when Francis and I wrote our first proposals to NOAA about hypoxia out here, we basically got thrown out of the room. They said, you guys don't have any hypoxia out there. It's all in the Mississippi River or it's all in Chesapeake Bay. And it, it took us about three rounds of applications to NOAA before we got the work funded to say that it's actually happening out here. 
So this is what it looks like off Oregon. It develops on the open continental shelf. So that's what we're gonna try to understand. You go out in a vessel, you lower over an instrument. In the old days, you would capture water, uh, pickle it with some chemicals, bring it back to the lab and do a Winkler titration. Now we use electronic sensors, lower it down through the water column and we get a profile of oxygen. So this is a couple examples from a, a one of the early low years, 2002, that's in red. Uh, depths here are uh, zero uh, down to 40, 50 meters. The black is the long-term average at the Newport hydrographic stations. And so you can see where we've got plenty of oxygen in the surface, it starts to go down and then we pass below the hypoxia threshold quite a ways above the bottom, you know, 10, 15 meters. So let's look at this room for a second. Anybody, anybody guesses how high this room is? So I'm like two meters, uh oh, I'm walking out of the box. Two meters, somebody, somebody hold up their thumb and do how many twos all the way up there. This is like we do in the scouts. How big is that tree? 10 meters, that's it? That's why the OSU football players can't throw it. <laughs> I think that's more like 15 meters or so. Anyway, you get the idea. That bottom layer is pretty big on the bottom. Okay, and then there's that severe hypoxia. So right at the bottom, we're approaching that. Okay, so this is a video that uh, I put together long time ago. In fact, we were still the College of Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences. But it, uh, it shows what hypoxia is, and you'll have to listen to me. So let's see, Cinnamon, I turned this off, is that right? Each spring, our coast is dominated by winds that blow from the north to the south. This wind is the engine behind ocean currents that move cold water up from the deep ocean to the coast. This upwelling can be seen from space as a band of cold water that forms along the coast. The upwelled water is naturally low in oxygen. Upwelling currents also bring nutrients to the surface of the ocean, where they fuel the growth of microscopic plants called phytoplankton. Phytoplankton bloom and fuel a productive food web in the upper ocean. The phytoplankton eventually sink toward the seafloor where they decompose, using up oxygen in a layer of water that has less oxygen to begin with. All right, you guys get the idea? How do I go back in this thing, Cinnamon, I guess? Huh. That's okay. How do I go backwards in the animation? You'd have to start the animation and then go back a slide. This one? Yep. And then go forward a slide. Yep. Then you should. Let me just get the first image up here. Each spring. Okay, so quick story. Alan Dennis was a high schooler in our college. And uh, he was started playing with the first 3D rendering software. I said, I can, let's make an animation. So notice he's got the, the sub seafloor geology. And then he also put in the Willamette Valley and all the mountains and stuff. I said, Alan, stop it. We just want the upwelling. But he went ahead and did it. And uh, he went on to uh, undergraduate career at OSU. We employed him in the college. And now he's like a 15 year employee at, at OSU. So that's how you hook people into staying in the field. All right, here's the, here are the consequences of um, low oxygen. So some shots showing um, rafts of Dungeness crab up in the, in the inner tidal, uh, fish dying off in the rockfish communities. These are a lot of the underwater stuff's courtesy of ODFNW's video program. And that super striking one in 2006 uh, lots of um, animals on the seafloor, including the infauna, the worms dying out because the oxygens were so low. In fact, I'll show you in a minute, they were zero. 
So in that paper that Francis led Chan et al, you can see the video of this. Also some dying off of the um, sunflower sea stars. It was quite um, sad. Here's another interesting thing that I hadn't thought about is you go out in a fish survey to get ready for the assessment. This is the International Halibut Commission and you, and you find zero halibut. And so you go into your model, right, and put the zero in. What are you going to, you know, what's that going to do to all your plans? And the answer was they weren't there because there was no oxygen. So you've got to know something about the environment. So that's the, that's the idea is we want to know more about the seafloor oxygen distributions. All right. So one of the ways we do it on, in my team is to fly these gliders. I'll do I'll come back another time and do talk on what all the cool things we're doing now, including including acoustics from gliders. But you fly them down into this layer. They actually get within three meters of the bottom. They come back up and they phone the data home to us and we get this picture almost in real time. And I have not filled or contoured this data at all. These are each of the up down cycles. There's something like a couple hundred of them in that. So the NH line has what, Kim, eight section, eight stations across there. There's about 200 of these. So it's a huge amount of data, but it brings into sharp focus in a two dimensional way, what the oxygen looks like. So really big, big point is the source waters are not hypoxic. Waters that are cruising along at the, at the top of the California undercurrent and are gonna be upwelled are not hypoxic. There has to be a shelf process through that respiration of the organic matter that drives it to hypoxia. Um, there's so much resolution here, you can actually see the internal tides, which I didn't think possible, but we do. These are, that's what these uh, spikes are downwards. So these are internal motions that are completely moving around the water column. But sure enough, in that zone up at the mid shelf near the bottom is where we detected the, uh, the hypoxia and the effects on the organisms. Thanks again to our ODF and W colleagues. So this is kind of the conceptual picture. And this Virginia Gouin uh, put together a nice article in Nature and made this figure for Francis and I and kind of shows what's going on. The remarkable thing is it's reaching right off the shore. So you're, you're in a research vessel like the Alaka and there's a crabber maybe even in shore of you. It's right near the rocks. You're thinking to yourself, how could this happen? You know, there's wave mixing, there's winds. How could there be low oxygen right, right next to shore? So that's what's new is it's reaching the, what we call the inner shelf. Uh, Fast forward a little bit, this, we made this video, I don't know, a year or so ago. I really encourage you to take a look at this one because it, um, it connects with the Quinault Indian Nation and how it's affecting their fisheries and their waters. And there's a great scene of Francis walking through the Portland fish market, talking about the species that are affected up there. There's some cards of this if, you're not, if you don't take your picture fast enough. There's some cards on it out front. All right, so let's talk about changes in time now. So another thing we do is we take this very simple bottom lander. It's about as tall as I am, loaded up with instruments and we put it out at 70 meters of water off Cape Perpetua. And we've done this every summer now for 20 years, something like that, 15 years. And with all these things, you know, we don't, nobody's funding us to do this per se, but we're just cobbling it together from all sorts of places. ODF and W, uh, we've had some private funding, et cetera, PISCO. So we measure the currents, the temperature, the salinity, the oxygen, and we've started to add in some of the carbonate species and the nutrients. And it's offshore of the Strawberry Hill 15 meter, which is in the Cape Perpetua Marine Reserve. So this is one of our sentinel sites. 
So you can look at a time series of oxygen. So I'll get my pointer back here. On the y-axis is again, uh, DO milliliters per liter. There's the hypoxia threshold. These are three different years. And there's two types of data put on there. There's the DO down here. And up here is the density of the water or the salinity you can think of. So at the beginning of the sp spring transition and the upwelling season, lots of oxygen in the water. And then it plummets and continues to descend through the season. And then right about now, actually yesterday, the famous fall transition, when the first storms start coming through and mixing it up and it reoxygenates the water column. Um, these little dots are the source water. So this is how much oxygen is drawn down by the, by the respiration. And then you can see there's ver variety in the years. So uh, we've been starting to call this the hypoxia season. And just to, and using that visual analogy to the wildfire season, because people in the valley at least, maybe not so much here except in 2020, but in the valley or on the east side, there's wildfires every year now, late summer. And it's very visual, right? That smoke fills in. So it's a way, we're just trying to connect people visually to what's happening on the, on the bottom of the ocean, the, the hypoxia season. Okay, so what Kate Adams did in this paper was realign the, those time series from the true start of the upwelling season that year, right? You just figure out when the winds start blowing to the south and you adjust it and boom, they come right in line. And you can now make a calculation of what that descent rate is down towards severe hypoxia. That gives you uh, the uh, overall consumption of oxygen. Then you can break it into the biological part and what's left over. And that's what the little graph is on the right. And the biological part came from Francis doing bottle studies. So he would capture water, take it back to the lab and look for the respiration signal. And then we just difference the two to get what we're calling the rest of it, which is the physics. That's my stuff, right? So that's the, that's the currents pushing the water out. That's the vertical mixing of higher oxygen water down into the lower oxygen bottom layer. And it's actually, this is a classic interdisciplinary problem. You can't figure it out from just one or the other. And Francis and I always say, it's easy to, to say it's gonna go hypoxic. That's the easy part. The real question is, when is it not going to go hypoxic? That is, what is the physics that's going to keep it from doing that? Because there's plenty of organic matter falling down. If you respire it all, you'll suck all the oxygen out. OK, that's changes over a season. What about changes year to year? Here are a bunch of 50-meter um, casts that show the variation from year to year. I just showed you one of them before for 2002. So different years, it's super thick. Sometimes it's half the water column. So that's what I mean by it. Low oxygen reaching right up into the water column and close to shore. So we, we first, you guys have heard this story. We first learned about this when Al Pizar and others said that the octopuses were climbing up the crab lines, trying to get out of this water. And reports from the fishermen of halibut and other fish being up in the water column. 2006, it hit zero. So that paper that uh, Francis and I wrote was about anoxia uh, being seen off the shore. So now instead of just going to that one spot, we're gonna go a little bit wider out and take all the data we can find and make a plot like this. Uh, depth on the y-axis and then dissolved oxygen along the x-axis. And you can see the blue colors show the oxygenated water at the surface. They come down and they start to approach the oxygen minimum zone. So the oxygen minimum zone is a large scale ocean feature 
um, set up by the by the uh, the largest scale currents, and it it's way down there. In our at our latitude, it's seven hundred meters down. We are not upwelling waters from the hypoxic OMZ. Well, where we are doing it from is about 150 meters, so right in here. So you can see there's a little variation year to year. So I'm gonna come back to that in another 15 minutes or so. But the really, the really striking thing here is the filling in of this area right here of super low oxygen in shallow water. That's what was new. And that garnered us a point on this map, which is not really a good thing. It's kind of a badge of shame. But um, Denise Breitberg and others put together a, a map of the whole world showing the various hypoxic zones, the red ones being along the coast and then the blue ones being the, the, the larger scale OMZs that are increasing in, in size. And again, I, I said that a lot of the other ones are in some enclosed waters, Chesapeake Bay, the Baltic Sea, et cetera. Ours are on the open coast. So you can big, read that big long-winded thing about deoxygenation. I went to a meeting in Washington, DC, and a person did a meta study. They took all the hypoxia studies and they took all the OA studies and their influence on the animals. Which one do you think was the most important? Yeah, yeah, it was like there had been, I was speaking earlier about the influence of OA, which is important, but if there's no oxygen, who cares what the OA is, right? So it was just drilling home that idea that this is a really fundamental issue worldwide. Okay, so here's the new stuff. Whole bunch of measurements of dissolved oxygen at sea. And we do it from ships. Uh, we do it from those gliders I talked about. Uh, we did a little Pisces summer school where you can teach students to do this. It's a really fundamental uh, measurement that we take. The one in the upper right is Victor Simon sitting with a trawl mounted Seabird CTD. So it sits inside that pr protective PVC and goes on the trawl of the groundfish surveys for NOAA, gets lowered down, dragged near the bottom, and we can get many, many observations from that. So I got the idea to do, to do this paper from 2021 because everybody was on the water that year. It was incredible. So these are all the different surveys off the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I'm very thankful to everybody for being out there and for willing to dump their data in. So uh, you recognize a lot of these, you guys participate in them. There's the JSOS, the pre-recruit saver, the Northern California Current Surveys, the large Hake survey that Northwest does, the uh, groundfish on the chartered fishing vessels, the West Coast OA survey that Dick Feely leads, the halibut commission that I referred to. Uh, or Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife did a survey of inshore waters. And then we had a couple sets of gliders from my lab and from the Ocean Observatories Initiative. So about 800 vertical profiles of, from the ships. There's uh, 10,000 from the gliders. So it's a hu huge amount of data. It's distributed in time like that. So the dashed lines are the, what Steve Pierce and I calculate as the upwelling season from here to here. And then here's when the various surveys went out. And then this is, the, this is example of what we have to do. So this is one of the new guys, Sean Coleman, who's been working on this for about a year with a whole bunch of NOAA data uh, you have to process it and then plot it up, make some sense of it. This is a time series, goes this direction. And I've just labeled a couple of the uh, variables here. So the trawl descends down in pressure, goes along the bottom for a while, comes back up. And in cyan is the plunging temperature. 
the salinity goes up as we get into saltier water, and then we can measure the dissolved oxygen. And in this area near the bottom, you can calculate, you know, when it's reached a, a nice stable depth along the bottom, and then you take the middle 80%, average it all together and call that your bottom value. So we do that over, over and over for these guys and do the uh, quality assurance, quality control stuff on that. Okay, so these are the near bottom DO values from all those surveys over time, just like I showed it to you for that single mooring. But now it's all over the Pacific Northwest. And you can see that there's, you know, there's high oxygen at times, but this envelope here towards the bottom goes down over time, just like we saw in the single point mooring. Okay, so now my next finger is the big payoff. This is, this is the, the sharply focused view of what the oxygen looks like off the Pacific Northwest. There's been some previous studies. Uh, Jay Peterson and the, and the Newport Hydrographic Group did a nice paper. Um, it's got some of the similar patterns, but if you look at it and look at this one, it's like putting on a pair of eyeglasses where it, things come into focus. So now we can really start to pick apart these little areas. So I like to say that we're now we have a map of the underwater geography of where it's high oxygen and where it's low oxygen. So now we can start to think about, okay, what, how are we going to work with the ocean? Where are the good areas? Where are the not so good areas? Uh, we also calculated how much of the continental shelf inshore at 200 meters was hypoxic. And the answer is about half, which is absolutely remarkable. For that season, half of the water was hypoxic near the bottom. And then I uh, did some other statistics. So there's uh, it's 15,000 kilometers squared. Interestingly, it's almost identical to what Nancy Rabelais found for the Mississippi River. We were saying that but when we were, wrote those first couple of proposals, but now we really know that it's of that scale. It's um, the size of the Willamette Valley. So think about that from Eugene to Portland, that whole area. It's the same size as the Seattle metropolitan area same size as Connecticut. And then uh, nature made me put this in, it's half the size of Belgium. They say, what's the Willamette Valley, Seattle? We don't, we don't know any of that stuff. Oh, half of Belgium, now we got it. Okay, and then uh, the next interesting thing is it's 645 to 1600 kilometers cubed. That's, so that doesn't mean much of anything, right? To, at least to, and then if I say it's 150 to 400 cubic miles, that's kind of an interesting number. But then I calculated that it's 200 to 600 million Olympic swimming pools. Because we, we were talking about this during the Olympics. Huge area. Okay, let's dig into this. Where is it low? It's low off the Washington shelf off Grays Harbor. It's low off Hecata Bank, and we had surmised that for a little while, and I'll explain why in just a second. It's low um, off the Columbia River. Where is it high? Well, it's high near the coast, where the water's getting mixed up, and there's tidal action and waves breaking and all that stuff. It's also high um, up near the Strait of Juan de Fuca, up in here, and then What's holding up in map after map is south of Cape Blanco, it's high oxygen. So let's talk a little bit about why that is. So the low oxygen is related to the shelf being wider. Or excuse, yeah, the low oxygen is the, the shelf is wider. There's a potential river plume interaction and a flow topography interaction. I wanna illustrate each of those for you in just a second. Near the coast, I've mentioned the mixing, uh, both due to currents, waves, and tides, and the narrow shelf being more efficiently flushed. 
So here's a figure that tests that wide versus narrow shelf. So uh, we have the shelf width down here, zero to 100 kilometers, and then the uh, lowest fifth percentile of the oxygen on this axis, and it's color-coded by latitude. So the red colors are further north. And there's a statistical relationship here, such that farther north on the wider shelves, the oxygens are lower. And I think that's because of the retention time. As the parcels are having to cross the shelf, there's more respiration going on, more retention. The Hecate Bank one, we kind of knew about because the that strong continental Coastal upwelling jet gets shoved offshore and leaves kind of a quiet zone of upwelled water over the bank, and it's a perfect incubator. So this is the chlorophyll over the bank. It's going to fall down, not get flushed very well, and it's going to lead to this low oxygen stuff. And that's where we first saw this when Alpazar and others told us about it was right in this area. So th these high things, what the heck is that? That's the mixing of the water flowing over the banks. And, and we actually saw it in our glider data from before. So as the big low oxygen layer, but as the water sloshes in back and forth over the, the banks, it mixes up. And in, this is many, many observations, thousands of observations from the gliders. So th that, those really are mixed up zones. Okay. Another one is this Columbia River idea. So what Barbara Hickey and colleagues showed is there are not nutrients in the river water. It's not like the Mississippi River. The nutrients are consumed mostly in the lower Columbia estuary. But what does happen is there's a, a flow out and it facilitates mixing of the ambient shelf water, which is high in nutrients, up into the surface. So it's mediated by that plume going out, pulling the the nutrients up and then that can that stuff can fall down and and be respired so we're starting to understand the oceanographic processes that lead to these patterns all right so what about changes in time in this spatial picture so these the map on the farthest right is the one i've been talking about 2021 uh, we gathered the rest of the groundfish data that's the middle panel and lastly, we went back into the archives for all of oceanography for that 1950 to 1980 plot. And uh, what I thought was really interesting is the patterns repeat. So that makes me believe that the oceanographic processes I've been telling you about are what are shaping that response. It's the level that's changing each year. And you can see it with your own eyes. The, 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 chain, the increasing hypoxia. So we've included the percent of the continental shelf in each of those maps. So the one on the right-hand side is about half. Uh, the previous decade, 2009, or two decades, 2019, 24% and hardly any uh, prior to 1980. And uh, we're also trying to get the message out. So this was in the Seattle Times. And they basically um, just took the figure as it was published and put it in there. So I, I hope it starts getting people's attention. All right, I have one more section to go and then we're gonna have time for questions. So why might it be increasing? There's a whole bunch of different ideas here, some of which we've worked on and others of which we need to do more work on and we need you guys to help. So worldwide, the surface is warming and it's inhibiting oxygen mixing down into the ocean. That's that deoxygenation it's happening uh, in the open oceans. Uh, it, also, it also could be that the upwelling source waters are from that 150 meters, the oxygen is creeping lower. That is, that is true, it's increasing it is decreasing, but it's not enough to explain everything we're seeing on the shelf. And what happens there is our source waters, you guys have heard this from the ocean acidification point of view, it takes decades to come from off the uh, 
north east side of Japan where the, where the water gets cold enough, it sinks down and then follows these decadal long paths to our coast. All along that path, it can respire. If that circulation slows down, there's more time for respiration. That's why the oxygen's going down. It's slowing down because of these climate change effects on the large scale currents. Uh, it could also be more respiration on the shelf, but I already told you there's plenty of organic matter to drive it to zero. There could be uh, more or less flushing. We're working on that one. But interest, this last one is what I'm going to show you is it might just be that there's stronger and more persistent upwelling. So fueling more of the system and generating more, uh, uh, both more material to be respired, but also keeping the upwelling circulation going rather than this flopping back and forth that we're so used to off Oregon. Okay, so how do we measure that? This is something we call the cumulative upwelling index. So on the right-hand graph, in the reds and blues, that's just the wind off Newport. So blue means it's blowing to the south, blue for cold during the upwelling season, red is the, the winter storms. And we use an algorithm to figure out uh, when the season starts and when it ends. And then we just basically sum up the upwelling. So that's the blue curve. And down, pointing down is more upwelling. So it cruises down through the season. Here's some really strong winds. And at the end of the season, we can get a single number of how much there was. How good was the upwelling season? And in 2021, it was cranking winds. There was only one year in, uh, in fact, the anoxia year 2006 when it was more. And just, I don't have time to go and do a ton of this, but what happens is the North Pacific high ridge gets locked into place and we just get winds after winds after winds instead of the occasional relaxation or reversal that we see. Okay, and this, and then this whole idea was uh, sort of predicted or hypothesized by Andy Bakken from the, the famous Bakken upwelling index. So under climate change, the land heats more than the ocean because the ocean is a huge thermal reservoir of cool. So you heat up the land, you change the atmospheric pressure gradient. There's geostrophic winds in the atmosphere that flow along the coast, so they get stronger. So that's this little diagram it's a, of a normal situation. There's a North Pacific high, the continental low because of the heating. The, uh, this is the flow in the atmosphere blowing to the south. And if you deepen the low under global warming, you can blow more wind. Another way to think about that is that the, um, the persistent upwelling of Northern California seems to be migrating north like consistent with the climate change predictions of, of the, uh, the migration north. So what we did next was to take that cumulative upwelling index for each year and plot it as a time series. So that's what's in black here, in the black curve. So I was showing you 2021, which is right here. There's 2006 and a whole bunch of variability over time. But you can fit a curve to it and it's statistic or a line to it, and you can it's statistically significant. Now, back five or six or seven years ago, I would not have I would not I was not one of the people that said we were seeing strengthening winds. Now, now there's a statistical relationship. And it's for sure true in Northern California in the sort of point rays uh, kind of area. All right, so I said just for fun, let's since I live in the valley and it's been getting hotter and hotter all the time, let's look at the Portland airport and see how many 90 degree days there were. And lo and behold, you guys all know this, there's more and more and more, right? So I just plotted those up and they're slightly low pass filtered. There's something like 20 to 25 days a year where it's over 90 in Portland. So that's the deepening of the, of the low pressure over the, over the land. So it seems like this hypothesis might, might be working out. Um, 
three of the largest upwelling years in the last 15 years. And if you take those slopes, you can say that this unusual 2021 could be routine by 2050. Could be routine. All right, I'm gonna finish with what's going on in this last few years. So 2021 on the left, Sean Coleman and I have just been working up all this data. There's 22 and 23. Not as much, but still a significant fraction. So we'll be uh, putting this in a publication soon. Our bottom lander off Strawberry Hill at 70 meters in the red line also shows it was hypoxic. This time I'm showing 2024. And the last thing I'll do is update the plot that I showed you and add the 22, 23, and 24 data. And the trends are continuing. In fact, look at the 90 degree days, they're, they're staying high. So that overall, this is just confirming what we're all seeing, right? In, around the world, the, the uh, things are getting warmer. So quick summary. Uh, what we're doing uh, next is we're get, starting to gather the 24 data. If you'd like to be part of a synthesis, let me know. Um, we've got to do a better job of getting this out quicker. So we're going to work with Nanus to try and build a, a hypoxia page that we can get this stuff out quicker. And what else are we doing? Oh, multiple stressors. It's not just oxygen. It's ocean acidification, temperature, and harmful algal blooms. So we have a new NOAA project to put all of those together. So thanks for your attention. There was a lot of great stuff, so I'm sure there's questions. Um, so if you have questions online, go ahead and put it in the chat box and then I'll see if I can work around the room. I'm gonna start up and then come back down. Whose hand? I saw it, I saw it. Somebody's hand? No, no hand? Making things up? All right, I just went for a run. <laughs> okay. Cinnamon, cinnamon's running up and down the stairs. So Jack, I know we've talked about this a little bit and you've tried to help sometimes too. When, for example, Mark and I have been out sampling, doing some of our bycatch reduction work over the last few summers. Um, and sometimes we can get caught in this trap that you were describing. For example, it just happened where we were working on Pacific halibut and some of the work occurred in an area where they weren't because it turned out that once we got out there, we started seeing low oxygen measurements in the CTD that we were using, mm. of course, in coordination with the work. And I'm just trying to think about how better we could align ourselves to do adaptive sampling so that we don't wind up in that situation. Because it's hard to get the funding to go out and mm. do these projects. And then if if you're sampling in an area where you're not able to answer the question. Yeah. So I, I think one thing you could do is consult the OOI buoys, right? Look at the near bottom real real time dissolved oxygen values from those sensors. So there's one at 25, 80 and 550 meters. So that might that might be helpful for what the levels are. And then you have to think a little bit about which way the currents are flowing. So that's one that's one aid. If you remember Waldo when we first worked with Amy, we decided to cross a gradient just for that exact idea that we didn't we didn't know which side we were going to be on. So it might be you can use these maps though. I think the patterns will will uh repeat. Yeah, I'm really encouraged. Yeah. So Jack, you've you've put together this really compelling vision of like a geographic machinery off the coast that produces these consistent mm -hmm. patterns that vary from year to year. And so what strikes me is that we have this situation where the South Coast has, it both has a narrow shelf, but it also has winds that blow like a bat out of hell, right? And even when it's not doing that up, up here. And then it also has things like the Rogue Canyon, you know, that would provide a different access to, to different, you know, layers of water. And so I, what I'm wondering about is how, have you like teased out how powerful that geographic machinery is relative to changes in wind? So if, mm. for example, it, is the wind so powerful there that it can over, like that the shelf width would not be able to 
uh, become hypoxic or basically teasing apart those variables. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, there's another one in this that was buried in that um, flushing or less flushing thing. And that has to do with the stratification and the, and how the water flows on and off the shelf. So remember the surface segment flows going out, but it has to get filled in from below. And the depth at which that happens depends on the stratification. So if it's coming in along the bottom, that's bringing in low oxygen water. If it's coming in in the, in the middle of the water column, that's not as bad. So there's a little bit more to it. And I have not teased all that apart. Can I follow up? Yeah. Is the South Coast hypoxia proof? Say, say it again. Is the, is the South Coast hypoxia proof? Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't think, I think on average, yes, but not from events. And I say that because uh, some of our colleagues just a little further south of those maps are do see episodes of hypoxia. That actually, that's one other point is, this is a really brute force statistic, right? The average hypoxia. We got to dig into the exposure lengths and all sorts of stuff. So there's more, there's more work to do. So Jack, great talk and lots of interesting stuff there. I'm going to kind of try and bring it back to something we discussed in the breakout session yesterday about getting this information out and getting it used um, for fisheries management mm -hmm. and in the council process. And as you probably know, they do this uh, State of the California Current Report or, you know, sort of IEA. Um, it's the, you know, the um, assessment stuff that's on an annual basis. And one of the things that I see in your graph for the upwelling um, index, you, I think you said um, you were using the um, cumulative upwelling index, but the units don't it, it says cumulative wind stress yeah and um basically and i also saw in one of your earlier graphs that the time frame was very long in 2021 right so the yeah. upwelling started earlier and it ended later right so it's that's which is also a measure of the cumulative but yeah. i think that they in the um IEA and the California Current Report use um, uh, what they call QD. And I'm just, I wasn't clear what exactly the difference was or why they weren't using what appears to be the same units of metrics that you were. And they showed, you know, that same longer time period that I think was in your last graph through 2024. Mm -hmm. And they, essentially show that the, you know, upwelling, that QD index at 45 degrees north was basically level and not trending one way or the other. And so I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, you know, tease things out mm -hmm. here and get, you know, try and figure out why they're not having exactly the same sort of units or results that okay. you are. So I'm going to give everybody else a chance to leave the room before we get into. This is going to take a little while. No, I won't take that long. Um, this, this, the cumulative thing, just right off the bat, that's that's consistent. You know, it's just the two chunks at the ends of the season. So now the units and what is the QD? The the what I'm doing goes back to Bakken's original idea. You take the wind stress and you bring up the water. What uh, Michael Jaycox did is add in an, an additional effect of, from the geostrophic onshore flow. There's a, there's a pressure gradient in the ocean that brings not just the flow along the coast, but onshore, offshore. So that's the extra thing that goes into QD. And it's usually a, a few percent, 5% or something like that. It, it, it is, it can be, you should you should include it. I think it's a good thing he did, but I don't think it's it's not a huge number. It's not like a fifty percent effect. So I I'd, I'd be curious to look. I haven't done that actually. Look at his stuff for 
the recent years. Yeah, and, and I should say that uh, there's a really nice, Kim and I saw it last night in the Canadian Pisces monitoring report. They do it off of, um, in Canadian waters, they do exactly what I do and they show the length of the season and the magnitude all in one graph. All right, we got a question online and then we'll wrap things up. Now that there is more reliable data on geographic locations of these expanding low O2 areas, are there any forecasts or predictions from biologists on invert or fish population responses? Yeah, I think that that's right where the cutting edge is right now. And I think, I think the biologists will agree with me that what we need are those studies at the edges of these oxygen zones to see what the effects are. And we've, we've done some of that work. There's more to do.